Bird Note presents. To enter David Kuhn's little green cabin is to step back in time. I'm supposed to be retired, and so I'm looking for ways to be retired. <laughs> but I'm not going to retire from recording. It's uh, I still have good hearing. Kuhn's been recording birdsong here on the island of Kauai, one of the northernmost islands in the Hawaiian archipelago since the mid-90s. I remember making the recording of being there and experiencing whatever ecosystem I was in. This recording's from 2005. Is that? That's characteristic of Akeke'e. The birds we're listening to are predominantly honey creepers, a diverse group that descended from a Eurasian finch three to five million years ago, and that we heard about in our last episode. But in just about the time that David Kuhn has lived on Kauai, some three decades, the honey creepers endemic to this island have nearly vanished. These sounds can bring back memories that are part of my wealth. The threats to the honey creepers have stacked up over the years, and we haven't discussed one of the biggest, which we're devoting this whole episode to, avian malaria. In fact, some fear it might just push these birds over the edge to extinction. But a new solution may just save them from the abyss, if we can keep the birds alive long enough to apply it. This is Threatened, and I'm Ari Daniel. Hundreds of years ago, it's said that if you approached any of the Hawaiian islands, you'd hear eruptions, not of volcanoes, but of birdsong. In fact, this trail on Kauai that I'm walking along at the moment, a forested ridgeline across a plateau, is called the Pihea Trail, which means cacophony in Hawaiian. Once upon a time, you couldn't hear yourself think for the birdsong on this trail. You would look up, you wouldn't see clouds and blue sky, you would see flocks of birds in a Hawaiian forest. Ecologist Lisa Callie Crampton is guiding me on this trail. And she says that when she first arrived here in Kauai 12 years ago, that hubbub had lessened. But there were still places she could camp where the chorus of birdsong jolted her awake in the mornings. However, things aren't what they used to be. It is just eerily spookily quiet. Callie runs the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project, and when she took the job in 2010, there was only one federally endangered species on the island, the puiohi, a thrush found here on Kauai and nowhere else in the world. They are the only fruit-eating bird left on Kauai, at least native species. And so fruit eaters are primarily responsible for seed dispersal of fruiting species. So it's a really important species to forest regeneration. So without the forest, there's no birds, but without the birds, there's no forest. While only the Puiohi was federally endangered when Callie began her new job, she soon got some bad news about two species of honey creepers, also found only on Kauai. The Akikiki, an acrobatic and vocal little gray bird with a pink bill, and the Akeke'e, a bright yellow bird with a forked tail, black mask, and crossed beak. The Akikiki populations and the Akeke populations were declining at alarming rates, and the ranges were contracting significantly. At that time, we thought that there were more than 1,000 Akikiki and more than 3,000 Akeke'e. By the time we did the next round of surveys in 2012, only two years later, it became evident that, in fact, there were much closer to 500 or even fewer Akikiki and 1,000 Akikei. In just a few years, their numbers fell by more than half. These are the birds that we're in search of on this hike. Callie's moving at a good clip, but she's skeptical we'll see any. Both the Akikiki and the Akekee have been on the endangered species list for over a decade, and the extra protections that listing afforded were pretty much too little too late to prevent the sudden decline. Nowadays, our reality is vastly different. We 
believe that there's not 500 Akikiki, but maybe 50 Akikiki, and not 1,000 Akake, but maybe 700 Akake. The precipitous decline of these birds is due to numerous causes, clear-cutting the forest, expanding towns and agriculture, Invasive predators like rats, which eat eggs and birds. Invasive flora, which cause habitat loss, a process accelerated by other invasive species like feral pigs. And then there's the thing that seems to have pushed these birds over the edge, across that invisible line where more individuals are disappearing than being born. Callie points to a series of puddles beside the path we're hiking along, small pools of standing water. So we do sometimes find mosquito larvae in these pools. Mosquitoes, in particular, the southern house mosquito. It's an invasive species that arrived in the 1820s as a stowaway in the water aboard whaling ships. And this mosquito now carries the parasite that causes avian malaria. It's related to human malaria. It causes the same set of symptoms, but only in birds and it's fatal for many Hawaiian honeycreepers who have no evolutionary history with avian malaria. They are naive to this disease, just the way we were naive to COVID, and it has had dramatic consequences for the honeycreeper species the way COVID has had dramatic consequences for human populations. Avian malaria probably began to spread in earnest in the early 1900s. Mosquitoes bite the birds anywhere that's unfeathered, the beak, legs, and the eyes. It's affected a variety of birds, but more recently, the honeycreepers have been hit especially hard. Mosquitoes mostly like it where it's warm and humid, so they kind of just simmered at low elevations around the coasts of the Hawaiian Islands for a very long time which wiped out the birds at lower elevations. But climate change has warmed the islands and created more standing water, which has opened up new habitat for the mosquitoes at higher elevations. And so the insects have advanced farther and farther upslope into the remaining honeycreeper refuges. And avian malaria is now decimating these birds too, which is why finding a solution to avian malaria has been the focus of intensive research for the last 30-some years. It's a little warmer in here. Oh, yeah, it's a little toasty. Yeah. Do you keep so it at 80? We try to, yeah, just about 80. Research ecologist Dennis Lapointe is an entomologist by training and has done a variety of experiments on the mosquitoes in his lab here. They're fascinating insects, so... It's a love-hate relationship. There's no question about it. While Callie has dedicated her life to the honeycreepers to save them, Dennis has devoted much of his to these mosquitoes to destroy them. He shows me his mosquito rearing room at the USGS Pacific Island Ecosystems Research Center inside Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. We gaze into a jar half filled with murky water and mosquito larvae darting about. So these... These are the culprits. These are the culprits as babies. (laughs) They're still innocent. They're quite small at this point. As the forests of Kauai have steadily emptied, a new possible solution in the battle against avian malaria has slowly taken shape over the last 25 years. It's called Wolbachia. It's a variation on something called the sterile insect technique. Dennis takes me outside to elaborate. The whole idea is to take a male of the insect that you want to reduce in the wild. You raise vast quantities of them in the lab, and then you sterilize them with radiation or chemicals. So when they mate with the wild females, the result is huge numbers of eggs that will never hatch. If you do this successively over time, you can suppress the population. But in the case of the southern house mosquito, this technique not only sterilizes them, it also knocks their mating behavior off kilter. They can't compete with the fertile males. So Dennis and a team of researchers changed course, turning their attention to a different means of achieving sterilization. That's where Wolbachia comes in. It's a bacterium that lives in the reproductive tracts of numerous insects, including the southern house mosquito. It can cause a breakdown and reproduction. It's called cytoplasmic incompatibility. 
So there are variants in this bacteria from one population to another. And for reasons that aren't entirely evident, sometimes when a male mosquito has one kind of Wolbachia and a female mosquito has a different kind, they won't be able to reproduce. The eggs won't hatch. So Dennis and his colleagues across a variety of agencies under the name Birds Not Mosquitoes... Gets to the point. ...are going to release males with Wolbachia into the wild. But for this approach to be effective, to crater the southern house mosquito population, the researchers need to flood a place like Kauai with these males. And that's challenging. How do you get all those mosquitoes out there? Currently, programs that are attempting to do this in Australia and Fresno, California, they're able to drive through communities and release their mosquitoes out of the back of a van. We won't have that uh, luxury. So we are either going to be hiking these mosquitoes in by the hundreds of thousands and releasing them in the field, or we're going to have to develop aerial techniques for that release. And to succeed, they'll have to do these releases again and again to knock the mosquito numbers back to near zero. So it's no slam dunk. Plus, there are still some regulatory and funding hurdles, and there's always some risk involved with a plan like this. So, you know, there's a long history in Hawaii of bringing things in that then create problems. Feral pigs, right. and mongoose. So that's, that's definitely a concern when you do something like this. But these are still valuable tools, provided the regulations are put in place and people proceed cautiously. So you feel that there's minimal, if any, risk? I don't know if I should be saying there's no risk, but I, I think the... Birds Not Mosquito group is convinced that the risks are fairly minimal. And the potential payoff. Of course, the potential payoff is, you know, phenomenal. We really are stuck at this point. We don't have a tool. This is the first tool that's come along that doesn't send up red flags everywhere. And so we think it's worth pursuing. So I'm cautiously optimistic. A new infusion of federal funds adds to that optimism. A solution is desperately needed and has been for decades, but it's still not ready yet, and the honey creepers may not be able to wait. So Callie and her team are working to buy them a little more time. How they're doing it after the break. Back on the Pihea Trail on Kauai, this is where that carousel of bird, bug, and parasite has cycled over and over again with devastating results, added, of course, to all the other threats. To keep the Kauai honeycreeper numbers from falling further due to avian malaria, ecologist Callie Crampton and her team ushered in a multi-pronged offense, including one effort that was especially badass, collecting eggs. I know, that may not sound heroic, but trust me, what follows is something out of a heist movie, but with the noblest of motives. Yeah, it was a pretty epic undertaking. And this is an endangered species, and if you knock the nest out of the tree of an endangered species, you you could imagine everything would be shut down. So, super delicate. A process requiring five to seven people. The idea was that once they had the eggs, they'd hatch them in captivity and raise the malaria-free birds in a protected environment, giving the species an insurance population in case their parents crashed out completely in the wild. For the honey creepers, once the eggs were removed, it often motivated the birds to relay. The akikiki usually produce two eggs, the akekee two to four, and each egg tends to weigh a bit less than a blueberry. They're tiny. They're tiny little eggs. And so we partnered with San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance because they're experts in handling these tiny little eggs. And when the eggs were about 8 to 12 days old, so the embryo was fairly developed but not in danger of hatching, we would target it for collection. Which meant everything was arranged last minute. Find a nest, make sure the eggs are the right age, 8 to 12 days old, and if so... Launch the chopper. We would fly a 100-pound, 40-foot extension ladder into a clearing in the forest a couple hundred meters from the nest. They wanted to be far enough away so the nest wouldn't be disturbed. And we would drop the ladder through the forest on a line from the belly of the helicopter and then hike it to the nest. And then 
we had to figure out how to position the ladder about a foot away from the nest at nest height, suspended by really, really strong ropes that were lashed off to trees. So it was freestanding. It's a freestanding ladder. So it has two feet on the ground. You can imagine that this is 100 pounds in a tight forest clearing, often tighter than the one we're in right now. The ladder needed to reach nests that were about as high up as a three or four story building. And then once it was in place, put a harness on the climber, put a harness on somebody on the ground, belayed the climber like you would for rock climbing, just in case something happened with the ladder or they slipped or whatever, they would not fall to the ground. And despite all this commotion, there'd be a tiny female weighing about as much as a AAA battery, holding strong, sitting on her nest to keep her blueberry eggs safe. She would frequently just sit there until the climber was halfway up the ladder. And up they went to the nest to reach in and grab these tiny little eggs. They'd carry one of those wide-mouthed thermoses filled with pre-warmed millet. Think roasted couscous. They would open the lid of the thermos, extract the cup of millet, take it to the nest so that they could basically position the eggs directly into the little cup of millet. And then once they had both eggs nestled in the millet, they would gingerly put that back in the thermos, screw the lid of the thermos tight, and lower it to the ground on a rope where it would be caught by somebody at the bottom of the ladder. That cup of millet would be transferred to a small cooler, retrofitted with a little heater powered by six-volt motorcycle batteries to keep the eggs warm. Then they'd strap it onto something like a fanny pack. And we would slowly hike our way through the forest, often be up and down. We'd have to pass the cooler up the hill to each other as we all scampered up. They'd get into the waiting helicopter, then fly to a breeding incubating center just in time, because if they clocked it right, only two to six days later, the eggs would hatch. And then they would feed them until about the time the eyes open, maybe eight or ten days, and fly them in a small cage on Hawaiian Airlines. <laughs> to the, the enclosure. Yeah, the conservation breeding facility on Maui, yeah. Like I said, badass. Callie and her team managed to collect eggs from 32 Akikiki nests and a dozen Akike'e nests. From 2015 to 18, this dominated Callie's life. And yet, despite these heroic and intensive efforts, the declines continued. After about an hour and a half of hiking, Callie finally stops. The past and present flicker before her. It has been 10 years since I saw Puyohi in this area and eight since I saw Nakikiki. They have just receded and receded and receded. So you're saying where we're standing now is kind of looking into the future? Yeah, what we have seen here starting 10 years ago is now happening in the last three to five years deeper in the range. So at a bastion of the Akikiki population, we have gone from probably close to 100 birds in 2015 to only four birds last December. The word freefall comes to mind. A hundred birds to just four in the heart of Akikiki habitat. It's a devastating loss for Callie and the researchers she works with. For my team, my team that's out there every day working with the birds, they know the birds by these colored bands, bracelets they have on their legs, or by their plumage, or by the territory they normally hold. They're saying goodbye to almost friends. Like, there's no Akikiki greeting you in the morning anymore. One of those birds was there for years. We knew it. It's like going and knocking at the door, and no one's home. Like the plague, right, when houses were emptied in Europe. So, you know, there are moments of overwhelming sadness because we haven't been able to do enough yet. It was in the midst of this sadness that Callie reached out to a woman named Keahi Manea. You know, it was such a personal thing. It's like they wanted to share it with somebody outside themselves, somebody that doesn't go into the forest like they do. Keahi, who's 79, spoke to me at a park on the east coast of Kauai. Since 2011, Callie has invited Keahi and her group to bless the research season through special songs, prayers, and invocations of the ancestors and Hawaiian deities, a kind of sanctification of the science. 
I'm a member of Kaimi Na'awao o Hawaii Institute, which is a cultural institute established in the late 70s with hula as our educational base. And what is hula? Dance. It means to dance. Last year, Callie told Keahi that their grief had grown too great to keep it to themselves. She and her research team invited Keahi's group to one of the Honey Creeper field sites to talk about their feelings of loss. We went up there on a rainy day, and they told us about not being able to find birds that they had names for. They couldn't find them. They were gone. We're losing them so fast. That particular outing with Callie and her staff really was touching. Here's Callie again. She, you know, thought about it long and hard and about how, what would be appropriate in Hawaiian tradition. She composed a little ceremony for us. My staff attended and they spoke their thoughts and we spoke our thoughts and we chanted awe, which is alas. Mm. But it was just an opportunity for us to just share how, what a bummer. <laughs> What a bummer that all our hard efforts are weren't working and our fears. We didn't do anything. We didn't. We sang. After everybody said what they wanted to say and we talked about it and we could reassure them what, you know, what more can you do? You're doing all you can do. You're getting in helicopters, you're dropping down into this remote forest in the rain. What more can you do? You're doing all you can. So go ahead and be sad if you want to be sad. All this was cooped up and she let us let off the steam and mm. shed our feelings. It was great. Yeah. Just comforting somebody that's telling you that they're feeling a loss. That's all it was. It was their bird family. It also strikes me that you were there to bear witness. Yes, so yes, that's a good way to put it, exactly. Yeah, it was like a eulogy or like a funeral. A eulogy or a funeral for so many individual birds, but not yet for an entire species. Because this solution to avian malaria, Wolbachia, is so close, and everyone I spoke to wanted it like yesterday. Keahi, chief among them. Hallelujah! You know, go for it, do it. They can't do it soon enough. If the scientists trust it and have studied it, and believe that it's the way to go, then do it. Mosquitoes aren't native to Hawaii. (laughs) Come on. So you're all for getting rid of them. Yeah, exactly. Execution, yeah. The hope is the Wolbachia mosquitoes will be ready for release in two to three years. That timeline's probably okay for the Akekee, but not for the Akikiki. Callie Crampton told me that without intervention, they're likely to be extinct by early 2023. We've, you know, we have decided that the most prudent thing to do is bring more of them into conservation breeding until such a time, a couple years later, hopefully, as Wabakia is available on the landscape controlling mosquitoes and just release birds back into the wild. Mm. So it's more like a, maybe even a holding Right. Um, you mean like bring the malaria under control with the Wolbachia? Right. And then once malaria is under control with the Wolbachia, we can release birds back into the wild. We're just keeping them safe. Right. Like a bomb shelter, right? Like keeping things safe. Ever since the day she showed up for work on Kauai, there's been a downward trajectory of these birds. But Callie is heartened by the promise of Wolbachia, combined with other conservation measures currently in place. So... We hope that once the Wolbachia landscape level of mosquito control is available, not only will we arrest the declines of Akikiki and Akake, we may be even able to start seeing them repopulate areas and their populations increase because the habitat will be in good shape and, and ready to be filled, you know, by these birds. All these efforts helicoptering in ladders to collect the honey creeper eggs, poring over the perfect way to sterilize mosquitoes. These are the extraordinary options we're left with to save the honey creepers, all because we're not reducing our emissions. For that's what's opened up the higher elevations to the mosquitoes to begin with. 
Still, the final chapter has not yet been written. I have to keep assuming that there is a way, because the minute you give up, there is no way. Perhaps one day, before Callie retires, she'll come to the forests and hear the raucous chorus of her friends once again. And as for that hike on the Pihea Trail, I never did see a single Akikiki or Akike'e. In Hawaii, the current extinction crisis is a stark reality. Two-thirds of the birds here have gone extinct since humans first set foot on the islands. Some are lost forever and we'll never know them. But some are still with us, in a way. Stories are our memories in many ways. And so stories about birds or other lost species help keep them alive in our imagination. Next week on Threatened, the story of one such bird and its role in the royal lineage of the Kingdom of Hawaii. This episode was produced by me, Ari Daniel. It was edited by Caitlin Pierce of the Rough Cut Collective. Audio mix by Sam Johnson and Mark Bramhill. Fact checking by Connor Guerin. Our theme song and original music were composed by Ian Koss, with additional music by Blue Dot Sessions and Sam Johnson. Threatened is a production of Bird Note and overseen by content director Allison Wilson. You can find a transcript of this show and additional resources, Bird Note's other podcasts, and much more at birdnote.org. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. <laughs>